Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Lifetime Training Podcast. And I've got the one and only Mr. Paul Kriegler back with us today to talk about an amazing and controversial and confusing thing. But we're going to simplify that all to you today in the world of supplementation. Paul is our program manager for all Lifetime uh, Nutritional Products. He's a registered dietitian, certified personal trainer, sports nutritionist, and an avid uh, athletic and, and athlete in the endurance realm and, and, and more. And he's been with Lifetime for 12 plus years. And again, thank you back for coming back on the show uh, with us, Paul. Thanks for having me, Jason. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, supplements is such a funky thing. And, you know, it, it relates back to me when I, when I was in college, this was in 96 and I had to write a single paper for a credit and I wrote a paper on, on creatine. And I remember getting the paper back from my instructor back then. And he said, I'm going to give you a, a passing grade on this, but I just want you to know that everything that you wrote about with regard to creatine is, isn't true. And it's a bunch of BS. <laughs> and, and I fast forward back to today and say, Oh my God, that was not even 20 years ago. Uh, or maybe it was. And, and, uh, and it's probably one of the most well-researched supplements out there right now uh, for proven results. But I had to kick off the story because it just it baffles me on the confusion, which hopefully we'll, we'll try to put to bed today, uh, at least somewhat with regards to supplements. So, you know, why is it, you know, so crazy? Why is it so controversial in, in the regulation or, you know, is it regulated? Is it not? I'd, I'd love for you to start there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, it's a contentious topic with a lot of people. Um, there's, there's advocates on, on both sides, both for and against, you know, the, the supplement industry as a whole. Um, it kind of dates back to 1994. There was a landmark act that Congress put into motion, uh, signed into law. Uh, it's referred to as um, the Deshay Act. Okay. It's Dietary Supplements Health Education Act. Um, and that, that really put into motion the supplement industry. And it was this newly Christian, christened space between pharmaceutical drugs and food and beverage. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of got this, its own lane. All of its, you know, the whole spectrum is, is regulated by the FDA, um, but there's different sets of regulations <laughs> for pharmaceutical drugs and over-the-counter medicines dietary supplements and food and beverage and cosmetics. So uh, that's where the confusion is. It's the same federal agency that's responsible for overseeing all those industries with different sets of guidelines and rules. Um, and the, the rules and guidelines that govern dietary supplement makers and marketers are just looser than pharmaceuticals, but they have very similar effects. You know, if they're properly formulated, dietary supplements are certainly more potent than food in some instances, in terms of the nutrients they deliver, um, but they're not as well standardized as pharmaceutical or over-the-counter medications. So it, it very much lives in this gray area where supplement manufacturers and formulators and and marketers and practitioners can develop good products, but it's not, it's not uh, exactly a perfect science in how that reaches the consumer. Got it. Um, basically, you can make a supplement formula up, get somebody to manufacture it, and then bring it to market without the same rigor and safety steps mm. that pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter medications are held to. Yeah, there, there's two things I remember, you know, I don't know if you saw it back in the day, it was a documentary called Bigger, Faster, Stronger, I think it was Bigger, Faster, Stronger, yeah. where they went in and they just talked about proprietary blends and how they, you know, just basically concocted a bunch of nonsense with, you know, very, you know, barely any ingredients in it, but just enough to be able to say it was in there. Yeah. And, and then they pushed it out to market. It's a great documentary. Yeah. Um, but in the, you know, in the industry, that's, that's known as pixie dusting or window dressing. Yeah. And, and it, you're, you're putting something in the product or in the formula that you're allowed to mention on the label, but maybe it's not at the right dose yep. uh, to have any effect at all. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a lot of very successful brands today still getting away with that. And it, it drives me nuts. Yeah. And, and it's definitely something that, you know, we want to talk about the clinical dosage and, and, but, but something that you said that I want to go back to before we go there, 
You mentioned something around supplements being as good, if not even more potent than food. And I know that that is a huge topic where, oh, I don't need it. You know, I can get it from my food. And, and can you go into a little bit more detail around what you meant by that and, you know, how a supplement, you know, in your opinion is or is not as potent or, or what we need uh, with regards to just getting it from regular food? Yeah. I mean, think purely physiologically or as a clinical dietitian, um, what you're aiming for is nutritional adequacy. You know, give the body the nutrients it needs to build and maintain and repair itself. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's what the goal is, is give the system, the biological system, the ingredients it needs to run as designed. Um, and that's what gets me excited about studying what, what are those, you know, mechanisms, what are those amounts, what are those relationships? Um, and as, you know, as I practice as a clinical dietitian, you started to see people that are at risk, certainly of, of clinical deficiencies, which means they're consuming levels of nutrients, you know, vitamins or minerals or other essential nutrients that are below the requirements for them to just avoid disease. And that's where the RDA is set. The recommended dietary allowance is, it's kind of the bottom rung of the ladder, if Got you it. will. This is, you know, these are the amounts of nutrients that we think, we think are enough to avoid disease. And then there's some other target that isn't well-defined, uh, the very same nutrient, but a different amount of it in a different context, maybe in a different individual or population, that is a better level of that nutrient to take in consistently to have the, fu the system function optimally, Yeah. right? So there's, there are two separate targets. Um, and that's where people also get confused is, oh, I don't need them because I can meet my, my baseline needs through some good food choices. Well, that, that's true sometimes. Um, but as, as the food landscape has changed, you know, we've gotten, we've gotten soil quality that's you know, way lower than it used to be. We've gotten processing methods that strip nutrients out and, and long shelf lives that allow nutrients to degrade and, and that sort of thing. So there's a number of concerns where in all practicality, getting your nutrition only from food really isn't all that common or realistic anymore. And that's where supplements have a, a can have a very um, important role in filling the gap. Because if you run a system without, you know, supplying what it needs for so long, then you start to have metabolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point that turns into disease states and, you know, controlling the symptoms of disease states is, is what we do with pharmaceuticals in this country. Um, but that doesn't address the physiological basis for the problem um, unless you correct the nutritional status of yeah. that person. And, and I think the big thing for the listeners out there too, something that you had said in passing, that is, I think the highlight here is minimum dose to stay away from disease in mm -hmm. optimal health. And, you know, if you think about it from that perspective, you know, where all these requirements, the RDA is off of the minimum dose that you need to make sure that you're in optimal health. And then we haven't even talked, then there's optimal living. And then we haven't even got into, okay, those people that work out and, you know, yeah. most of the people that are probably listening to this podcast, you know, spend three to five hours a week, if not more training at various intensities. And so what about that group and how it relates? Yeah, that's a good question. The RDA is set for sedentary populations. Wow. They're actually in, in the history of the RDAs, there really hasn't ever been a consensus around what are the micronutrient needs. So vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids um, in exercising populations, there has been some headway in the macronutrients. So better defining protein requirements and carbohydrate requirements yeah. to support exercising populations. Um, but in the, in the micronutrient space, it's, it's a, it's a desert landscape in wow. terms of research and clinical consensus. Got so it. we're, we're kind of left with this shotgun approach. Like we know that the RDA, you know, try to eat and strive to get that through your diet as best you can. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, you probably need the supplement and there's certain nutrients that, um, you know, on the label, when you look at them you're like, I don't, do I need several thousand percent of the RDA of certain B vitamins? Um, in exercising populations, I would say, absolutely you do because yeah. you're consuming those nutrients or utilizing those nutrients at, you know, several, 
several fold higher uh, rates than sedentary individuals. Got it. Got it. And so let's go back. Now we talked about, you know, uh, you called it pixie dusting and, and the ability to put something on a label to say it's in there, but yet it's not anywhere near what I've heard the term clinical dose. Would you explain what clinical dose is? And then, you know, explain how, you know, that all that works within the supplement world. Yeah. Um, let's see, a, a kind of a, a, a good example to use is vitamin C. You know, you can prevent scurvy with 60 milligrams of vitamin C, and that's fairly easy to, to achieve through dietary intake. If you're, if you're consuming fresh, uncooked produce, because you can destroy some vitamin C using a couple different cooking methods, but call it, you know, have, have a bell pepper each day, a couple pieces of citrus fruit and some broccoli that's lightly steamed. Um, you can meet your requirements for vitamin C um, at about 60 or, you know, 60 or 75 milligrams per day of vitamin C intake. Well, there's other clinical evidence that shows people who exercise, you know, they generate some anti- uh, some oxidative stress in their body. So they need additional antioxidants and vitamin C function has one of the functions is as an antioxidant mm -hmm. in our system. Um, there's a different tipping point for them. If they're at or above 200 milligrams per day from supplements, in addition to diet, you tend to see uh, less frequent and shorter duration, upper respiratory illnesses. So we know people exercise they're putting their body through physical stress. Sometimes they're at higher increased, you know, increased risk of certain seasonal illnesses and that sort of thing. Um, well, then there's even a different scenario is if they are cl clinically sick or, you know, acutely ill fighting off a, a bug, dosing them even higher with vitamin C has some additional benefits. Um, and there's good clinical research on each one of those scenarios. So that's one example of you have your baseline needs to prevent disease, and then there's a little bit higher need for, for certain populations to avoid the worst outcomes from any disease or pathogen. And then there's the acute time period where they might even need to dose higher than that yep. to ensure, you know, minimizing the damage of their body's own response to defeat the pathogen and then speeding the recovery and kind of the, the restoration of of uh, homeostasis after the illness has been, um, you know, acquired, fought off, and now you're trying to resolve and, and get back to normal health. Got it. You know, and, and one of the other things, you know, too, is obviously the price spectrum is across the board. And, mm -hmm. you know, from some of the things that I've heard, and I'd love your opinion on this, is that, you know, if you go to a certain outlet, whatever it is, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, your bigger retailers that are out there, let's say, um, and they have a this rhodiola rosea, whatever that's, that's a, a supplement. And they say that it's in there and then they take it and it's like, it, it didn't work, but you're paying less because the quantity of the supplement that's needed for them to get the positive impact that the studies have shown are nowhere near the same. So, you know, I think is there anything you could say about how that works too? Because I think we see that quite a bit in, you know, just your, your one a day, you know, besides absorption and all that other stuff, but some of these bigger retailers that sell uh, supplements and even some of the MLM companies. Yeah. I, I mean, so there's, there's two, two issues you kind of asked in that question. Yeah. One is the underdosing thing. So yeah. maybe they're not dosing it properly um, or manufacturing with high enough quality standards. And then the other one is, uh, scalability. So a lot of companies that are out there and in your face and you see them everywhere that you go, uh, big box stores, Amazon, you know, basically if they're sold everywhere and marketed everywhere, they're probably spending more money on marketing and discounting than they are on the ingredients in the formula. Mm -hmm. So that to me is a red flag. There's, there's too many marketing companies that happen to sell supplements and not enough supplement companies that do a great job of marketing. <laughs> right? That's crazy. Um, so what I caution people against is, you know, if, if you wouldn't go to the car mechanic and ask them for the cheapest brakes they have, then don't shop for the cheapest supplements you can find. That's great. It's the same logic, right? You yeah. want the best for your safety and health. Um, 
so if you're gonna if you're gonna skimp on anything don't skimp on the brakes in your car or the supplements <laughs> in your cupboard yeah um and i don't know if i answered your question yeah. well enough there but it's a red flag to me to see things that are always on sale it's a red flag to me to see things that are sold online, not directly from that manufacturer. Um, so if you're buying something on Amazon and you see it's super cheap price and it's not sold by the, the company who made it, be very aware. There's been dozens of reports of counterfeit and adulterated products sold on, um, I'm picking on Amazon, but it's any, any number of online retailers uh, where people are passing off counterfeit goods um, and they're taking advantage of kind of the health craze or people that are genuinely interested in, in supporting their health, but not breaking the bank at the same time. So it's, it's a little disheartening. Uh, the FDA and uh, other organizations at the federal level try to minimize that. There is a, you know, there's a, a list you can access publicly of adulterated dietary supplements. And in 2020, and now we're in 2021, but in 2020, there was got close to 150 specific products that were cited by the FDA as being adulterated and flagged for consumer safety, taken off the shelves. Um, but if the FDA is chronically under-resourced as well. So if they're good enough to find 150 a year, uh, specific examples that they need to warn the public about, it, it, it scares me almost to know, to know that there's yeah there's probably three times or five times that number out there on shelves somewhere that the FDA just can't get to. Yeah. And, and those are the pot, you know, I, I just, I just remember taking a whole lot of Fedra back in the day and Mao Hong and you know, all those, those supplements that, you know, some had Mao Hong and Ephedra in it, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Herbal formats. So there's well, those, and, you know, most, most recently it is, it's kind of isolated to the weight loss and the, the sexual performance categories of dietary supplements yeah like the male enhancement product market is just don't buy that stuff like <laughs> you see it at every gas station or yeah. pharmacy or whatever but i'm telling you there's pharmaceutical ingredients in I'm, them <laughs> i'm i'm laughing i'm sorry because i keep thinking of a joe rogan comedy skit in one of his stand-ups when he talks about that and he obviously can't talk about that here, but if you don't if you have the chance to go watch it <laughs> Yeah, but it, the point is, it's a very real problem. The FDA yeah. is trying to address it, and they they just can't keep up. So yeah. that's why it's like, it just just don't go bargain shopping for your health. It's yeah. just not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, so let's let's change into now. You know, quality. Obviously, you know, you talk about bargain, and then there's the other end of the spectrum where, oh my God, it's so expensive. And you know why? You know, and and I'm assuming the quantity and the quality are, you know, the biggest reasons why <laughs> you're paying more for the supplement. So would you mind going into how do you identify, you know, a quality supplement versus something that might not, you know, be as, as of quality? Yeah. I mean, there's a number of certifications out there that some brands um, pay for to have on their, on their label, um, like national Sanit sanitation foundation, NSF, and, and they have a sport certification there. There's informed choice and informed sport consumer labs, um, there's banned substances control group. Lab door is another kind of newcomer on the scene that's been around for a couple of years, but they don't, I don't know about their traction that they're getting. Um, so there's a number of like third party proof in every bottle type of approaches and they all have good and bad aspects to them. Um, and Lifetime doesn't, we don't, we don't pay for any of those marketable um, certifications largely because none of them fit our needs mm -hmm. they don't do what you can do as a private controller of your supplement line so even even the you know some of those third party certification programs uh, i think of in 2018 there was a massive consumer advocacy uh, publication um, about protein powder quality you know this consumer adv advocacy group went out and tested over a hundred, you know, widely distributed protein brands, products uh, from a number of brands and found that a good majority of them had levels of heavy metals and other contaminants in them above the EPA standards, even in a single dose per day. Um, you know, we consume toxins like heavy metals every day. You know, the, 
they're part of our produce, they're part of our packaged foods, they're part of medications. But if any one product has a higher level than the APA says you can have, then it's a problem, it's flagged and it gets all the attention, right? So anyway, I brought up the protein powder to say there were dozens of protein powders in that report that showed up as tainted that had some of those third-party certification seals on them. They had <laughs> NSF certifications. They had informed choice, informed sport. They had BSCG. They had consumer labs or USP. Um, so it's not foolproof to have those certifications. Mm -hmm. And that's something that frustrates me because I want, I very much want to give someone a simple, like, look for this symbol and you're, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the reason some of those brands got into that position is while they have some dollars invest, invested in those testing programs and certification programs, they may also upstream in their supply chain be practicing what's called skip lot testing, which means when their manufacturer goes out and sources whey protein or pea protein, um, they get it from one supplier and they test and verify that supplier with the first batch. And then the next few batches that they get from them, they, they just say, oh, you know, we're gonna grandfather those in. And then we'll test like the fifth batch we get. And then we'll do every fifth batch after that. And just to make sure like we're on the level. Well, that can bite you in the tail, which I think is what happened with a lot of those protein powder companies. If you practice skip lot testing, you save money and cost of your product. So then you, you can increase your profits. Got it. Um, rather than do that, there's a better approach. If you really care about the health of the people taking your products, yeah. you just test every batch. Yeah. No matter how big or small the batch is, no matter how great your supplier is, you just have every batch tested at multiple steps throughout the process. When That's they great. receive it as a raw ingredient, before it enters the production floor, once, once it's combined with other ingredients that are going into the formula, you, you, you test that too. And then you test the final goods after it's been packaged. And that's when you know you've got a secure supply chain that's delivering a product that's dosed properly, it's efficacious, and um, it, it meets and exceeds all the safety requirements that you as the supplement operator, supplement company operator, are proud to put on the shelf. That's and that's, that's the way Lifetime operates. Mm -hmm. We put money into the testing that we get to control with our manufacturers and ad hoc testing on a random basis that we control, sending it out to, to third party labs um, and money into the ingredients and virtually no money into the marketing of our products. Yeah. And our main goal isn't to make money on supplements at Lifetime. We don't need to, we have, we make, we, we operate a business that's successful because we have a membership model. We have a, another services model. The products are just an additional value to those products and services or those, those services and membership programs. Got it. Got it. Well, and you know, I just, I, I got to go back. I, I will remember this for the rest of my life. This was many, many years ago when EAS had just launched and, you know, they had all their different myoplex and all that kind of stuff. And I remember sitting in a car, it was a hot, humid day in Chicago. And I remember sitting in a car with a buddy of mine and, you know, he let some go. He was on his third shake of the day and he let some stuff go that I literally was gagging and like going, Bleh! like I was puking in the car and it was hot. And I couldn't even open the door. It was smelled so bad. And, and there's gotta be, you know, some correlation between quality of product and, and what's coming out that way. Cause I know that when I take our stuff, I don't, I don't get that. Even if I have a couple of shakes a day. So, you know, it, it, I don't know. I've just, I never asked anybody this, but there's got, is, is there something there? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. It, it might've been <laughs> a larger issue than, yeah, than, than he had, that <laughs> but it, it, it goes to show you like, yeah. okay. So a lot of mass marketed products, they're, they're constantly looking at ways they can scale up the exposure of their, of their goods and keep their costs at bay. Yeah. Um, so especially in the ready to drink market, mm -hmm. you see a ton of ready to drinks that are, that are prepared with, you know, stabilizers, um, in different ingredients, stabilizers, texturizers, um, industrialized seed oils, like 
they're constantly penny pinching on, on the ingredients. Most of the companies are. Now there's some companies out there that do a fantastic job. Um, they probably don't have the exposure they want because they don't have the marketing dollars to help them get that reach. But um, you know, the, the mass marketed brands, in my opinion, is largely a racket. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I, I'd love to dive into now, you know, obviously lifetime has evolved over the years. And I, and I remember, you know, from the cafes and obviously the, the supplements into where we, you know, got rid of, you know, everything that, you know, had, you know, dyes in it and, you know, mm-hmm. artificial sweeteners and all of these particular things. So would you t- mind talking about kind of this innovative, approach and how we've gone from, you know, kind of, kind of right there with everyone else to really elevating the standard, you know, of what we will allow. And then where are we going into the future and how are we start to kind of package things a little bit easier for people to be able to get what they need, you know, and, and not be confused? Yeah, it's a good question. So when I started with Lifetime, it was 2008. And I think we still had protein powders on the shelf that had sucralose mm-hmm. or Splenda in them. And they, those had just been, the Lifetime branded ones had just been changed over from um, Ace K and um, I believe aspartame. Yeah. You know, in, in, the, in the late 2000s, we were basically in, in the middle of the pack with everyone else. We were using artificial sweeteners. I don't believe there were artificial colors in that at that time, even before the cafe, um, you know, came out with their, if it's here, it's healthy yeah. branding and brand promise and, and ingredient standards. Um, but we had switched to sucralose. And then shortly after that, in 2010, we launched um, those same formulas without sucralose and started using stevia. Mm-hmm. So we were on the leading edge of products available in the marketplace that were not using any artificial or unnatural sweeteners. Mm-hmm. Um, and shortly after that, in the early 2000 teens, we really upgraded our multivitamin formulas, um, our fish oil, uh, transitioned over to a triglyceride form fish oil. Um, but the multivitamins went to, you know, the best possible technology of chelated minerals and um, methylated B vitamins. So methylfolate. And, and for, for those that don't know what those two, can, can you explain what that means? Yeah. So uh, chelated minerals means the mineral itself, which is just a, it's a, it's an element, it's an inorganic element. They're very poorly absorbed. So zinc or magnesium, they're really poorly absorbed unless they carry a charge or are attached to an amino acid. Now carrying a charge means it's a salt. And if it carries a charge, um, when it disso- disassociates in your gut, that can irritate the gut lining. So a calcium carbonate or a magnesium oxide um, or a zinc gluconate, those can be irritating to some people in the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. So a better way to to ensure that you're tolerating and absorbing minerals is to wrap them in amino acids and that's called chelating the minerals. Got it. so we, we transitioned all of our formulas to have like these very high end designer style ingredients, forms of nutrients. Um, so that when people take them, they don't feel terrible and they actually absorb more of them. So their cells can utilize the nutrients the way they're designed to rather than poop them out. Yeah. Right. Cause that's, that is a major problem with tablet form vitamins, um, tablet form supplements is there they're hard to get at the nutrients. The nutrient forms themselves are oftentimes not the best uh, for you to absorb. Uh, They might cause irritation. Therefore, you're not even going to absorb the majority of the nutrients that you're ingesting in the first place. So in the early 2000 teens, Lifetime was like on the leading edge of all that technology, Um, putting the money, you know, putting the money where our mouth is really in terms of saying these are high quality because they're they have the right forms of the other nutrients you need to support your active lifestyle. And they have the, um, you know, higher doses of those forms because you have higher needs as an active individual. So they were engineered for our population um, so that we can get the most nutrition and most benefit out of them. That's, 
Did, that, did I answer your question? Yeah, so no, I'm absolutely. A, a, absolutely. So, you know, it, now I know that we, we've kind of going through some transitions of, um, you know, reformulating or and or packaging things. Would you mind talking about kind of where are we going into the future and how we continue to evolve and, you know, move forward? Yeah, the step we're in right now is um, we, we took a fresh look at our packaging and ended up, you know, showing that our, a lot of our products didn't look like the same family of, of goods. So everything's getting new packaging. It looks like one cohesive brand uh, for the first time in, in quite a long time. Since 2013, we were in the, all the bronze packaging. Um, but we're introducing a, a product segmentation, so a color-coded system. So that, like, you know, for daily nutrition, you're going to look for the tan color-coded products. So it's white bottles, white labels with little tan accents to it. Oh, beautiful. Um, and that's really our daily or foundational line. So it's the things that people will probably take for a very long time to just support their good health uh, because it's the nutrients that are filling in gaps that exist in almost everyone's diet. So yeah. it's like multivitamins, vitamin D, some minerals, for sure. probiotics, greens, most of our proteins. Those are really daily use nutritional supplements. Um, then there's an orange accented part of the line, which is performance. These are things that are formulated to help people get the most out of their workouts or fitness abilities or recovery from high, high level training. So um, that's where things like pre-workout and creatine, um, amino acids, isolate protein or performance multivitamins that lives in the orange segment, the okay. performance segment. And then there's um, our specialty segment now is gonna be accent color blue. And that, that includes like shorter duration programs, maybe more specific needs of nutrients maybe higher therapeutic dose or a very specific reason you'd take that form of a, of a nutrient. Um, and that's where collagen peptides lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that might surprise people, but collagen is, it's very unique. It's not a complete protein. Um, people should take it if they, if they want to support really healthy, supple skin, healthy, durable joint tissue. And, um, you know, sometimes even healthy hair and skin and nails, you know, um, uh, Collagen has very specific uses. Mm -hmm. um, it fills in certain amino acids, not all of them, but certain amino acids um, that a lot of people don't get enough of in their diet today. Um, that's where our detox program, program lives because it's an intermittent, you're not gonna do it all the time. Um, it's, it's kind of a shorter term um, supplement stack, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that's where we introduced our new immune stack. Uh, it's something that I think everyone should keep around, especially during cold and flu season. Maybe you don't take it all the time year round, but you have it on hand so that if you or somebody in your family does get sick, you can start dosing them with these, with these nutrients that help their body mount an effective immune response and then speed up the resolution of whatever damage is done by that immune reaction. Got it. So, so right now we kind of have three bundled packs, right? We've got the strength, strength stack, the detox, and now the immune, uh, the is immune stack. Yep. Yeah. And, and so do, do you see things coming into the future, new things or can't talk about that yet? Yeah. I mean, I can talk about my ideas, um, yeah. the timelines on how we're going to deliver this <laughs> are crap shoot, but yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, as everyone looks at their supplement cabinet, you know, I, sometimes I step back and I look at my own and I'm like, you know, there's going to be a day where I can take this group of products and make it into a system, just a daily system. And it have different pieces of it that I can customize for different segments of our population, or maybe even down to the individual customer level. Um, I know there's some companies out there that are doing a form of that right now. Um, we don't have time on this podcast to kind of talk about the yeah. pros and cons of those companies right now, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a time off in the future that we're going to be able to completely evolve the way consumers interact with the products and systems that are going to support their health the best. Got it. Um, and even down to packaging, you know, today we have a lot of plastic bottles and they're all recyclable. Um, but in the future, I would love to use some form of compostable packaging mm -hmm. or reusable packaging and minimize, you know, the total supply chain strain in terms of, you know, how many empty bottles do we need to 
send on a semi trailer to our protein powder manufacturer. <laughs> so there's got to be a better way. Can we yeah. make can we make the bottles on site? You know, if yeah. we have to stay in plastic. Um, and we're exploring that actively. We've had a couple different explorations into gusset bags. You know, those resealable multi layer bags. We ultimately didn't go with them at this stage because none of them are recyclable. Mm -hmm. They all have multiple layers. And some of the layers might individually be recyclable, but when you sandwich them together and make a finished package, they're not. Got it. So they end up being waste on the back end, even though they save a little space and cost on the front end of the supply chain. Awesome. Awesome. You know, and I just love the simple simplification that we're trying to dive into to make it just easier and, and more understandable on, you know, why am I taking what, uh, which is, is fantastic. So, yeah. you know, I, I've got a couple of questions. I, I, I'm just going to throw them at you and kind of on the spot here. And, and I'd love for you to answer, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, if, if you were to say there is one or two things that almost every single person should take, you know, that lives an active lifestyle. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it from a, a general population that is active three to five hours a week of some form of exercise on top of the stressors of life. You know, what would you say those, you know, you know, handful or less of things that they absolutely should be taking are? Uh, number one is protein. And I say that because if you fix someone's protein intake, it doesn't matter if they're high carb or low carb. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things automatically correct themselves if you address someone's protein needs and get them protein replete or protein adequate. Um, now protein supplements like powders, I don't even consider them supplements, but I think people should take them as a convenience food. You know, that's in my mind, that's, that's how they're categorized. Um, everyone who exercises has higher protein needs than, than the average sedentary person. And the down, the potential downsides of over consuming protein are almost non-existent. You know, the, Joey Antonio from ISSN has done a number of protein overfeeding studies in exercising populations and virtually nothing bad ever happens ever. <laughs> People eat, you know, so one of the studies, pe people in the, in the intervention group getting higher doses of protein were, were consuming 800 extra calories per day wow. and they didn't get fatter. You know, like yeah. who doesn't want that? <laughs> so, so what is, you know, to, to piggyback on that one, what is a general recommendation, you know, again, for that active population of protein that, you know, in grams that they should be taking in each day? Yeah, uh, a, a number of consensus reports or position papers have been published on that topic. It's, it's about a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. Of I use, ideal body weight. Of ideal body weight. Yeah, yep. okay. Yep, so, you know, the formula for that was developed by a MetLife insurance company back in the, I want to say in the 50s or 60s. Mm. Uh, but it's 100 pounds for the first, for females, it's 100 pounds for the first five feet of height plus five pounds for each inch after that. And then for men, I believe it's, I would have to look this up to be certain, yeah. but it's a little bit higher. It's like 105 pounds and then another eight pounds per inch of body or of height. Got it. Got it. So got that's it. how you'd figure ideal body weight. You could also use um, one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. Okay. One gram per lean body. So you got to know your body comps for that. Yeah. So okay. fat free mass. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So protein, I think is super important. It, it, it lives in the supplement space in most consumers minds, but most of our protein powders, uh, the ones that are just straight protein, they actually have nutrition facts panels on them, oh. not supplement facts panels. Got it. Um, cause they're, they're, they're just food ingredients. Um, so one of the, the questions, second, the second Wait. thing I think everyone should take is a, a good quality multivitamin that has enough vitamin D in it. And, like all of our formulas, for example, have over 2000 international units of vitamin D, which is roughly five times the amount as any other, you know, quality multivitamin that they might pick up from a, a mass market retail store. Got it. Um, and then fish oil. Got Omega it. Omega three from fish oil is another thing that I think everyone who's following a fitness routine needs to have. 
Got it. I, I want to take you back real quick uh, before I ask you one more question. You mentioned collagen and there was people that, you know, for whatever reason, that's the only one that they'll take. And you said that it's not a full protein sequence. Mm -hmm. So if they are choosing to do that, what should they also then, I guess, be supplementing with to get, you know, the, the, the well-rounded uh, protein amino acid uh, sequence? Yeah. I, so yeah, let me clarify that. Collagen only is, con is a concern nutritionally if it's the only source of protein you take in throughout the day. Okay. Um, it's the only form of supplemental protein you take, but you're eating other food proteins, you're probably doing fine. Mm -hmm. um, but collagen, it, it doesn't have quite enough leucine to trigger muscle protein synthesis. That's one of the amino acids that's you know tightly, tightly involved in triggering muscle protein synthesis. Um, and it lacks tryptophan. Okay. So, which is an essential amino acid. So it's just not considered a complete protein. That's why it's a little confusing on the label too. You'll see that it has 20 grams of collagen peptides, but it's only considered 19 grams of protein. And it'll actually say 0% daily value of protein because technically it doesn't qualify as a protein source. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. It's super, it's super confusing. I wish that would, you know, the, the categorization would change because it's a, it's a very, very healthy source of amino acids for people. Got it. Cool. So you said fish oil, you said a, a high quality multivitamin with enough vitamin D and then protein. A any one other one, if you were to pick one more. Gosh, that's where it gets, you could go, you could go to 10 different dietitians in your doctor <laughs> and you probably get a different answer. Got it. Still Got to it. this day. Um, magnesium. Yeah. You know, you, you, we just can't get enough magnesium in our food anymore. The soil quality is that bad. Um, and you know, 200, 250 milligrams a day in a multivitamin like we have, which is way more than most other multis, by the way, um, of a very highly absorbable form still isn't enough. You know, there's a lot of good clinical studies that are double blind uh, placebo controlled studies on magnesium and hypertension and magnesium and, uh, you know, diabetes or blood sugar control concerns that a bunch of magical things start happening when you get people above 300 milligrams of a day of, of, uh, supplemental magnesium, regardless of what they're eating in their diet, you know, just some cool stuff starts to happen to those populations where some of the health issues go away. Wow. And, and with magnesium too, you know, there's a lot of different forms of magnesium. Um, would you give a recommendation and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, and I appreciate all your time with regards to what are the better types or, or if there's a different type for a different issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously there's, there's cost implications across the different types of magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, magnesium glycinate is an awesome form. That's the form that's in most of our multivitamin formulas. Actually, it's in all of our multivitamin formulas. And then uh, malate, which is, it's technically a salt, but uh, malate is a very highly absorbed salt. It's very well tolerated. And the malic acid that the magnesium is complex, complexed with helps with mitochondrial energy production. Beautiful. So, you know, so many people today struggle with fatigue or lack of focus or, you know, muscle cramps or, or what have you. Um, lack of strength and stability that oftentimes if, if you get them, you know, nutritionally replete and magnesium is one big component of that. Um, it, a lot of their problems start to go away. You know, that's they feel awesome. a lot better. Um, and that's, that's the whole goal with a supplement plan is like, you, you need to just get people the nutrients they need on a consistent basis so that they can feel and function the way they're designed. Yeah. And it, it shouldn't be more complicated than that. If we That's don't great. need, we don't need to do <laughs> <That's it. laughs> weight loss supplements necessarily. We don't need to do the, you know, the latest, greatest pre-workout necessarily. Yeah. Maybe a small segment of the population needs that, but yeah. most people just need the unsexy multi fish oil protein and magnesium, and they will be different people in 30 or 60 or 90 days. Of uh, doing that. That, that, that's awesome. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I'd love to have you on. We could, we could talk about just the hows and wins of, 
you know, when should I take protein? When should I, you know, all of these different things. And, and we'll get into a lot of the different supplements in another episode, but man, I, I can't thank you enough again for your time. Any closing, you know, you, I know you mentioned something just there, but anything else closing you want to let everybody know? The only thing I would, I would mention is, you know, I know a lot of trainers will listen to this and supplements are a very confusing topic. Uh, so I encourage them to do as much homework as possible. You know, read the International Society of Sports Nutrition position stands on all the key supplements like creatine and protein and um, know those things inside and out because you're in a position to help people re-engineer their lives when you're a fitness professional. And if they don't get some of that information from you, even if you don't have a nutrition certification, they're going to look for it somewhere else. And I'm not super confident that they're going to find something that's actually going to help them out there in the ether. And that's what, that's what drives me and my passion around, you know, running lifetime supplement line is we've got a chance to make something part of, you know, make our products part of the most successful fitness programs on earth. (laughs) I firmly believe that. And, and, uh, there's some things that we need to do to, to shore that up and really, you know, bring it to the masses and, and, you know, be certain that we're, we're, we're absolutely the, the, you know, head and shoulders above the rest of the, the supplement industry. But um, we've got a, such a strong foundation that we're starting from That's we've been awesome. doing this for yeah. two decades and iterating and owning our product line um, as much as we can. And um, we're in a really great spot. Yeah. help a ton of people already. Yeah. And, and for those, you know, out there, you know, obviously if you're at Lifetime and you're a member within the clubs, you obviously can get them in our cafes. And then there's a whole extra, uh, you know, assortment of, of supplements that you can get on our website, which is, you know, you can visit us at www.lifetime.life and then click on the store and, you know, you get great auto ship benefits and, you know, all that, whether you're a member or not, I believe you can get access to all of our supplements and, Um, you know, I definitely advise you to take advantage of it. You get discounts with a trainer code. So if you're working with a trainer, obviously go ask, if not, you know, reach out to Paul and I, and we'll be happy to, to throw our codes your way. So, um, Paul, I can, on that, on that note, you know, there's, there's a lot of supplement companies out there that they've got good products, but if the, if the products are good and they're not used, but they're not used in a context of a good program, the benefits just aren't there. And if you have a good program, but you're not using quite the right products, your results are going to be lackluster too. So that's what really excites me is we've got good, smart programmers and we've got good, well-designed products of high quality. And when you marry the two together, yep. it, it's just exponential with, with the, the effectiveness of those things. So you know, if you take, if you're a customer out there and you take some products right now, but you're kind of following a, a random exercise program, get on a program and, and get some more value out of your supplements. If you're on a good program and you're not taking supplements, get on some supplements and it'll revolutionize your program experience. Um, I firmly believe that. So, yeah. and, and, and it's huge too, because, you know, so many people stop because they don't get results. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they're always looking for that weight loss result, but you know, by mashing these things together, you know, at the right time, you know, you'll see smaller, different goals that will keep you moving forward to achieve those bigger goals of, of whatever it is that your health and weight goals that may, that even whatever they may be. So, man, I can't thank you enough. I could, I could keep you on here for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, we are so grateful to have you on our team and, you know, leading this charge, Paul. So thank you for all the work that you do, the education that you provide and, and the time that you spend, you know, just, you know, passionately researching and, you know, diving into this stuff to make it simpler for all of our trainers and our members and, and everybody else that's, you know, listening or watching. So thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to being on here a few more times with you. For sure, man. <laughs> well, you have a great day, man. And thank you so much. And again, I'll put the details in the, uh, in the show notes so you can go and check out everything that you want to check out and see all the details and, you know, again, reach out to somebody in your region or one of us, we'd be happy to help you out. So thanks all and and hope you enjoyed the show.